glad you're here this morning. Um, it's a blessing to be able to be able to uh, be up here and to fill in for Jeff. He called me yesterday, I think at about uh, 10 o'clock, and he said, hey, I'm not feeling good. Will you fill in for me? So uh, this is going to be the year, I guess, of surprise ministry maybe for me. I don't know. I don't know. You know, I can, I can, I can function in that way. Okay, so it's a, it's all right. I'm kind of that way, kind of spontaneous, kind of whatever. So, um, and you know what? The Lord is good, though. And and I mean, really, in reality, when we step out in faith, God fills, and that is really the truth of what happens uh, in my life when I'm able to surrender. And it goes along really great with what we're going to talk about this morning. You know, I was just as an example of that. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in, I was in my office at, I work for a roofing company during the week and, um, I, I do office stuff there, computer stuff and all. And so, um, <clears throat> guy comes in, he starts downloading on all of these physical conditions that he got. And I'm like, dang, I am not a doctor. I have no idea <laughs> what's going on with you, you know, and here he is downloading all this stuff. And I mean, serious. And I'm just really had a lot of compassion for him in my heart, but I'm wondering why in the world is he doing this? What does he see in me? Uh, you know, and he had been to the doctor and they had checked out all the things. Well, in the, in the middle of that, I mean, it just dawned on me. You need to pray for this guy. You know, I mean, let's, let's take this and let's, let's use this for the Lord. And I don't always think, think that way. I don't know why it is, but you know, it, sometimes it's the last thing. Maybe it's my, um, I don't know. It's my thick head. I, you know, I don't, I don't know what it is. It's, it's actually what we're talking about this morning. But, um, uh, uh, so anyway, I prayed with the guy and it was just really a blessing. I mean, it was a mutual blessing. I know he was blessed by that. And I was certainly blessed by that as the Lord just really worked in that. I pray that the Lord works in his heart and, um, and all. So, you know, you never know in the circumstances that you find yourself in, you know, we need to be ready, right? We need to be ready for the situations of our life. And we need to be ready to move in faith in what the Lord has before us. So I just encourage you with that. And that's really what we're talking about this morning. We're going to be in Psalm 33, and we're going to be talking about hope. And I think it's really good for us to be here because we are in a time that is, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's hard. Um, for a lot of people, maybe you don't feel necessarily the difficulties of it. Um, but a lot of people do feel the difficulties of it. We're living in a world that is really having a struggle and having a hard time with the things that we're dealing with as, and this is the amazing thing. This is the amazing thing as the world, <laughs> as the world, we are dealing with this. It's not just localized in one country, this country, this county, this city. It is the world dealing with this issue. And that really shows me that God is in the middle of it. He is completely and totally in the middle of it. And so uh, with that, let's just open in a word of prayer. Lord, we're just really thankful for your word because it's a foundation to our hearts and to our lives. And we know, just as Jesse was praying, that um, in the middle of all that you have done for us, we find ourselves there. And so, Lord, we pray that you just open. Open our eyes, give us um, just a fresh new look at what your word says to us. As we look at this psalm, we pray that you would give us hope in our lives, that we would be able to see out of the situations that seem to be confining, that seem to be de uh, mandated, that seem to be whatever we, however we feel about it. Lord, your word comes into the middle of it and it totally gives us freedom. And we just really thank you for that. The reality of who you are brings that freedom to our soul. And we just want to, we just want to live in that Lord. We want to dwell in it. We want to um, have it affect not just our minds, but that it would flow out of the lives that in this, this body that you've given each one of us. And we thank you that you do that through the power of your Holy Spirit and the power that you give to your people. And we pray this in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So I'm going to read down through Psalm 33. This Psalm, we're not really sure, you know, who wrote this Psalm. It looks like from the internal evidence that, you know, David was probably the writer of this Psalm. And so we can, we can maybe assume that he wrote m the majority of the Psalms, but we're not totally sure. This Psalm really talks about the sovereignty of the Lord. It talks about his, his him being the foundation. And we're going to see that it is laying a foundation that we can completely and totally build our lives upon and that will produce hope in our lives. It produces hope. That's what it does. This foundation produces 
produce his hope in the righteous's life. So we're going to look at it in four different sections. We're going to read it first. The first section that we're going to look at, it deals with praise. And I love how this psalm starts out because it starts out with praising and worshiping God. The second section that we're going to look at is the word of the Lord or the foundation, the foundation of our hope the foundation of our hope, and and that's the second part. And then we're going to look at the third part, which is the conflict of that hope, or really it's the conflict of man, really, and what man... it's dealing with man. And, and, and then in the, in the fourth section of this, we're going to look at this. It's, it is, it is our response or the righteous response, our, our response to the foundation that has been laid. And so, um, as we read down through this, keep that in mind, and maybe you can try to figure out in your own mind how I'm going to break this up, but, um, uh, let's start out. We're going to read through the whole Psalm, then we'll come back and we'll talk about it. Rejoice in the Lord. O you righteous. For praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice the earth is full of his good, the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them. By the breath of his mouth, he gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth Fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men from his, from the place of his dwelling. He looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on all those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield for our heart shall rejoice in him. Because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. This is an awesome psalm, isn't it? I mean, it, it, it's amazing. And it is so fitting for the time that we're living in right now. You're, you're probably going, yes, 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 yes. Because it is God's truth and the spirit of God as he brings that truth into our heart, it comes alive. It's not just a written page. It's just not a written word, but it's living and it's personified. And that's what we're going to see here in a little bit. It comes alive. It comes alive and it is a person. So when we look at this, we see that this is, and we know that this is old covenant or this is the old Testament, right? I mean, David wrote, this is what he knew. This is what he knew. He knew the old covenant. And so we realize, and we have to talk about that, but the awesome thing about this is, and the awesome thing about the Old Testament and the New Testament is that the Old Testament is a shadow. It's a shadow of the things that God was going to do. It's, it was, it's a shadow of all that he was going to fulfill through in, in real ways. And we know in personal ways and through the person of Jesus. And so the really cool thing about the Old Testament is we can take the Old Testament and we can put the New Testament in the Old Testament and we can see that it seamlessly fits and we can drop that in. And I love that about the Psalms. As you read through them, you can do that. David had an understanding. 
His understanding was in the system that God had given for relationship with him. And it was through the law and through the ceremonial law that was given. And there was a measure of fellowship that men could have with the Lord because of that ceremonial law. It was intended for that, but that wasn't its only intent. The real and ultimate intent, as Galatian tells us, is a tutor to bring us to the person to the person of Jesus Christ. And so we can see that even in the Old Testament, it is so applicable to our lives. And so we can draw from it. And will we, with, with, un, with, with eyes that are unveiled and with, with hindsight, as we look back and we see what Jesus has done, we can fill in the things that David really didn't understand, even though he was prophesying and he was saying that. And we, we see that here in the beginning. The beginning of this psalm talks about praise, and it talks about the praise of the righteous the praise of the righteous. And it says there, rejoice in the Lord. I love this little section here, these three verses. They start with rejoice and verse three ends with shout of joy. Praise, worship should be joyful. That should be the expression of our heart. There should be joy that comes out of our lives because of the foundation that we're gonna talk about. You know, it it should naturally just bubble up in us that joy of what he's done. When we talk and we sing about the cross, it should be joy, the rejoicing of the fact that God has brought us near by the cross and the work of Jesus. So there should should be joy that just emanates out of the righteous. You know, when when God looks down on the world, he sees only two different kinds of people. He doesn't see races. He doesn't see colors. He doesn't see languages. He doesn't see all that. He sees past that. He sees through all of those things. The things that what he does see though, is he sees the once born, right? He sees the once born and he sees the twice born. Those are the two groupings that he sees. He sees those that are born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees that. He knows that. Those are the ones that, that, those are the ones that this Psalm is written for because they understand the foundation and the things that are written here. And they can rejoice in that fact. The once born can't, they don't understand. They can't see it. They're in conflict with it. What is written here, the world is in conflict with. So when we come to this, it sprout, it springs out of our heart and we have to understand, well, what is righteousness? In David's eyes, you know, he saw the one that keeps the law. You know, you can go through, you can go through Psalm 119 and you can see all of the references to the word of God, the testimonies, the counsel, you know, go on and on. It talks about the word of God in so many different ways and the law of God, what his requirements are. That whole, that, 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 as you live within that, there was righteousness in that. And, and, and that's how he saw things. But we also know that he trusted in God. He trusted in God's provision. So it was by faith that he came into that place, that he could actually, through the ceremonial keeping of the law, that he could have fellowship with God. It was through faith. It was by faith that he lived. And so in the reality of that, he's completely right. It is the righteous. But look at what he says about the righteous. And, and you know, you know in a sense, I mean, he knows that no one is righteous. In Psalm 14, earlier on, one through three, it says, to the chief musician, a Psalm of David, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. I mean, really, this is the, this is the reality of the human condition. Everybody. Th- this applies to everybody. There's an, it applies to all of us. Uh, Paul, Paul quotes this, and he finishes up the thought, there's none who is righteous. No, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There in Romans 3. He says that, but he follows it up and he tells us, well, what is righteousness? What is righteousness? In Romans 3, 21 through 22, it says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed 
So here we have God revealing. He has revealed the righteousness of God, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. See, the law and the prophets, they were a witness to the righteousness of God and what his requirement was. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and and on all who believe, for there is no difference. That righteousness is applied on all those who believe. The condition is belief. It is believing. And in that, as David did the ceremonial law, he trusted in God's provision. He trusted in the fact that the ceremonial law was there by God given to bring man into fellowship with him. And just as we know, that Jesus said, what did he say? He didn't come to take away the law. He didn't come to abolish the ceremonial law. He came to what? Fulfill it, right? To fulfill it and fulfill it completely to the point that we become the righteousness of God that he gives to us. I mean, it's amazing. It's an awesome thing that God has done because, you know, there is no way in our power that we can do anything to come into the fellowship of God. It is all from the old covenant to the new covenant it is all by faith that we walk into what God has provided on his provision, on his provision, on his provision. That's the only way we have fellowship with God. And look at what it says here in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we become the righteousness of God. And so out of the righteous one, what comes, springs out? Joy, praise, worship. That's what comes out of the life of the righteous man, the righteous woman. It's praise. And so it's fitting that before we get to the foundation of all of this, already the righteous, here there's praise in this psalm, um, just praising. And we have to think about this, praise and worship. Um, it's not just songs. It's just not words that are written down. It's not music. You know, this whole time that we have here together is really worship to the Lord, isn't it? I mean, it started, we started out singing the songs and really praising the Lord. And it was really a blessing. Um, that song, um, Ever Almighty, I've been playing it a bunch this week, um, and it's just really blessed me. I just love that, 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 that song it, and what it says about the sovereignty of God. It's amazing, and that he is able to save, ever able to save, and I'm so thankful for that. But you know what? Worship is, can be music for sure, can be our prayer to the Lord, but you know, really, the core, we can do all those things. I mean, a lot of people play instruments, right? <laughs> I mean, a lot of people in the world play instruments. A lot of people in the church play instruments. But really, what defines what is worship? We'll hear. This is the first reference of worship in the Bible, Genesis 22, 5. And I love to go back this, and I just want to remind you that this is what worship is. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. And he was talking to his servants, stay here. The lad and I will go yonder, not yoder. They will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Now, this is the amazing thing about this, okay? You think, well, right, yeah. He's going to go there. He's going to have a sacrifice. Okay, so we have to think about that, right? He, this is in Genesis chapter 22. The story there and the storyline is, is that God promised him a son, remember, and he didn't get that son. <laughs> he tried to do it himself through his servant, his maid, his, uh, you know, Sarah's maid servant. You know, he tried to make it happen in the flesh, and yet he couldn't fulfill the promise of God in and of himself. And yeah, and God did. He fulfilled that promise, gave him a son from Sarah, a miracle birth, and now God is requiring that from him. The thing that was promised to him, the thing that he had hoped for all his life, and that his future really, any kind of future really hung on that, right? And yet God is requiring him to go and to give that. And see, this is the amazing thing. You know, the attitude of, you know, I don't know how, you know, it'd be amazing to be in Abraham's mind. And, you know, maybe we'll be able to ask him someday, you know, what was really in your mind? What were you thinking? How did you do this? This is amazing. I mean, 
it really is overwhelming when you really start to think about it, that God promised something and then he asked him to give it back. And it not just, it's a, it's a, it's a young man. It's something that he had hoped for and longed for. And yet God is asking for him to just freely give it back. It's amazing. See, Abraham saw it and he says that he is going to go and worship the Lord. <laughs> so we see here that what is this? This is a selfless giving to the Lord. Just giving. That is what worship is. Regardless of the music, regardless of whatever we're doing, it is giving to the Lord. Worship is a heart of giving. Giving up even what is precious and even what we hold on to with all that we are, we give it up to the Lord. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, think of that as a parent, just giving this, giving this young person up to the Lord in this kind of a way. It is, it, 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 it's something that is really hard to understand, but it gives us that idea. This is what worship is. It is, a, it is a selfless, thoughtless, just giving to the Lord and, and obedience to him. And so that should be, you know, our heart when we, when we sing, when we worship the Lord. So we worship the Lord in a lot of different ways. We give of our time. We give of our money. We give of our, even our own lives. Uh, we give of our mind right now and our heart as the word of God, as we make a place in our heart for the word of God to be planted. That's worship because we're giving place in us, ourselves. So everything that we do here, you know, you, when you reach out to others, uh, you know, when we have a time of fellowship after the service, you know, praying for people, actually really being concerned about their life, asking them the body ministry, you know, outside, you know, calling believers up, <laughs> you know, saying, how can I help you? How are you? You know, those things are worship to the Lord as we give of ourselves. And so just encourage you in that uh, about worship. And then we all know this, just want to remind you of this, John 4, 23, this is Jesus speaking and 24, but the hour is coming now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship and in, in spirit and in truth. And this just really, uh, th this just really is, um, you know, God's heart to us about what, what worship is. It is a spiritual thing. It's not that we can do the physical and we have the tools of a guitar. We have the tools of a drum. We have the, the tools of an offering box. You know, we have all these things that are physical, but really the worship comes out of the heart and it comes out of a spiritual place of giving to the Lord. And as we give, we are worshiping and exalting him over ourself. And that is so, or over anything, and especially over ourself. So super important that we see that. Um, <clears throat> Romans 12, 1 and 2 is another really great verse about worship in general. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Or that word there could be translated worship, and it is translated in some places worship. Your reasonable worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be <clears throat> transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So in giving of our very life, it is worship. When we give over our heart and our desires, when we let go of ourselves, when we humble ourselves and repent before the Lord, it is an act of worship. And it is out of that heart that really prays because you know, when we repent, it is because of the foundation that we're going to read about here in a second. You know, one of the things, and I forgot to mention this, really what I want, what I want us all to really see through this psalm is this reality that when, when, when the spiritual, when the spiritual rules, the natural, when the spiritual rules, the natural, there's hope. But if the natural rules, there's no hope at all. There's no hope. And through going through this, I'm hoping that you will see that in a greater way in your life. Because that's not just, that's a principle that we can see in the world around us, in the greater world around us. Or, and especially 
We can personally be influenced by that in our, in our very individual lives and the finiteness of the situations that we're in. That when the spiritual is ruling, there is hope. But when the natural rules, there is no hope. And it's really important that we see that. And it's based on this foundation, this spiritual foundation that the psalmist lays here in this next section. This has to be the foundation that hope, and it will be the foundation that praise springs out of. It's the foundation that hope springs out of. Okay, let's read through this again. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the, of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the hosts of them. By the breath of his mouth, he gathers the water of the sea together. As a heap, he lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth Fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. This is the foundation of hope. This is the foundation of righteousness. This is our foundation as believers and children of God. All that we have springs out of this. And this is where I love, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament. We can come into this passage and we can see, well, wow, what is this it's talking about? The word of the Lord. What is it talking about? The amazing thing is, is this is personified. This is personified in Jesus Christ. In Jesus, this is personified. The word of the Lord. It's mentioned here three times, the word of the Lord, and that he spoke but this is what makes it so amazing and come alive to us, that it is the living word. And we'll see some scriptures here that really define that and give us a deeper understanding uh, of this. You know, David was referring, or the psalmist was referring to, you know, what he knew of the word, the written word, the law, those things, and, and the spoken word. He talks about that, the spoken word. But we can see it in hindsight, looking back at the counsel of God and what he has said and what he has done through Jesus Christ. We can see that actually Jesus fulfills this really nicely and very beautifully. In verse four, and as I was reading through this, I was realizing that you can substitute the word Jesus here and it really comes to life. Okay, so for Jesus is right and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of Jesus. By the word of, or by Jesus, the heavens were made and all of the hosts in them. By the breath of his mouth or of Jesus's mouth, he gathers the water of the seas together. And he, you know, it's beautiful that it just seamlessly just fits into this, what we know of the character, the nature of Jesus, that he is the living word of God. So as David spoke this, or as he wrote this down, there was an understanding that he had, but praise God, we have the fullness of understanding what the word of the Lord is. And this becomes the foundation. Yes, this, what all he has spoken, but also the person and the work of Jesus Christ in you. And that person and work of Jesus Christ begins, and it, it is so associated with the filling and the empowering, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, who takes the things that Jesus has said and brings them to life in our hearts. Oh man, I love that. I love that. That's what we need to experience. That's what should be motivating us to love the world, to love our families, to love the people around us, to do for others the things that we would want done to us. That's what should motivate it. The power of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Spirit through a life that's surrendered and built on the foundation that we see here of Jesus. Now let's look. Here is Jesus's, this is amazing how the New Testament brings this to life. This is one of my favorite passages, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. I mean, you could put the whole Old Covenant in that, the whole Old Testament in that. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds. 
who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and the and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high i mean this is an awesome section of scripture that really clarifies to us that jesus he he was there in the beginning and god the creation happened through jesus he was there. I mean, look at that. It's, it is amazing to see that, that um, whom, uh, through whom also he made the worlds, through Jesus Christ. He was there in the beginning. The worlds were made through him. Just echoes this whole, this whole thought process that's in here that David is talking about. Another really cool verse that brings this to light is um, uh, <clears throat> John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Nothing. This, these, were, these words are the foundation of all that we believe as believers. Everything else springs out of this. When you believe this portion that Jesus was in the beginning and that he is the creator and that he spoke all things into existence, this becomes the foundation of the life of the righteous. And the, this is God's will. <laughs> this is his will. And we can walk in it when we believe it and make it the foundation of our very life. Look at this, Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. See, these verses, they talk about, they don't say it, that he's sovereign over all things, but it's, it's there. It's not those words, but that's it. He's over all creation, everything. There is nothing that is not under his ability, his control, his decision, his will, nothing, not anything. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things consist. (laughs) <laughs> this, this, this is a powerful section of scripture about Jesus and the fact this is, this is where we have hope. This is the only place that we can find hope because all things fall under this. Everything that we see, everything that we could imagine, all natural things fall into this place. All spiritual things fall into this place of being under Jesus He was before all things. In him, all things consist. The word consist in here, if if, if you'll look it up, I mean, it's really, there's a sense of movement in this word. And in one of the guys that I was reading, he's talking about the fact that all things are moving towards Jesus. All things are moving towards him. All things, the natural world is moving towards him. People, they can believe whatever they want. But all things are moving towards Jesus. People spend their whole life trying to get out of religion, out of God, or, you know, all of these things. But they can never do it because all things are moving towards Jesus. And all things in the last day, all of us will come face to face with our creator and our maker. And that's the reality. And that has to be a foundation of how we live and why we live and why we live the things that we do. Because of that foundation of him being, you know, you know, one of the things that I think about oftentimes when we <clears throat> go to uh, communion and celebrate communion together is I think of the, I think of this verse actually, that in him, all things consist, that he holds all things together, that he holds them all together. And the reason that I think about that is because, you know, he, it's amazing what he allowed his creation to do. Have you ever really thought about that before? He allowed the things that he made to murder him, murder without cause. I mean, your little Play-Doh figure that you created rising up and murdering you. We are nothing. We are clay. Those people that were driving nails through his hands, they were completely, they consist and they hold together in his hand that they're driving a nail through. This is, this is amazing, and we should spend time thinking about that 
Because that is where the power of the Christian life is at, right in that place at the cross where Jesus gave willfully himself for his creation. That is, it should be the foundation. It should be, when we come to a place of trouble, when we come, it should be that that resounds in our heart, that he is the one who holds it all together and that in him, all things consist. Everything is moving towards him. Nothing is out of control. Look at what, and um, before we read this one, I just want to, I just want to say something really quick about, you know, the times that we're living in. I love science, okay? I am a science guy. I wanted to be actually an ornithologist. Anybody know what an ornithologist is? Somebody who studies birds. I love birds. They're awesome. Um, and I always have. I don't know why. My dad loved them, and we used to go and identify them, and we'd sit around and talk about them, and they're beautiful and colorful and awesome. And so I think I just developed that love for birds. So I love to do that. I don't do it near enough. But <clears throat> um, So science is something that I really love. I was in biology. I was at CMU trying to finish my degree, and I was actually doing the youth here at the church many years ago. And uh, I went to a conference, a youth workers conference out in California. And all of a sudden the Lord just put on my heart that I needed to be involved in ministry and I needed to let go of that. Even, even though I love it. And you know what? I was frustrated actually. I mean, really to tell you the truth because of the fact that the natural rules, the world, the natural rules, the world, the professors that are in the colleges, the professors that were teaching me all of the curriculum, nature rules, the natural rules, and as a spiritual person, how can you, it's like getting beat down, you know, all the time. And we feel that right now. We pro, you guys know that because we feel that right now, because that is the way that the world looks at all the situations that they come against the natural rules. There is no hope in that. There is no hope. When we come out of that perspective, we realize, no, actually, <laughs> you know what? God, science the natural world is not at all in conflict with God. We need to know that. We need to stand on that. Science, the natural world is not in conflict with God at all. The problem is, is that men and people and women and, you know, people that are ruled by the natural, they're the ones that bring science in conflict with, with God. It is not God who is in conflict with science. We've just read all of science. The whole natural world is under his hand. He is sovereign over it. And actually, he holds it all together. The problem is, and this is the problem. The problem is we only know a little bit. <laughs> that's the problem. That's where the conflict comes. And that's why the world says, hey, you can't, you can't have science and God together. You can't have science and faith. That's baloney. Because God is over science, and science is his. See, he trumps science. And I know that we know that, but let's think about that. Let's build our life on that. When it comes to things like we don't know, we say, we don't know. Hey, the doctors do that, don't they? If you go in and you have a physical condition, and they say, well, I'm not really sure. We've done all the tests, but we don't know. And then they say, hey, try this. Try that. And so you go through this whole protocol, trying all these drugs, these things that they say. You know, it's because they don't know everything. And what do we do? We walk out and we say, well, it's in your hands, Lord. It's totally in your hands. I have hope because I know that God is bigger than science, medicine. He knows exactly what's going on in my body. He knows exactly what's there. He has a purpose and a will for it. And we know that this isn't the end. And this is, this, is just, this is just a little, we're just pilgrims. We're wandering through this time. We're wandering through this world, trying to figure stuff out. You know, people devote their whole life to little systems, right? They do. I mean, what came up on my, what comes up on my, uh, my so social media feed, my Facebook, I do have a Facebook account. I don't really look at it all that much. I kind of scroll through it all. But all of a sudden, all these little wombats were, were coming on. These, these posts on wombats. You guys know what wombats are? They're marsupials that live down in Australia. I mean, they're really cool, okay? And they're super cute. Now you're all going to go look up wombats. And you know what's going to happen? Your social media is going to be full of wombats. <laughs> just like mine. So anyway, they're super cute and they make these little videos of these wombats they rescued. The thing is, is there's people that spend their whole life looking at a wombat. 
and studying a wombat to try to figure out what does it do, what it does. You know, all of these things. And you know what? They find little bits and pieces. Little bits and pieces, and it's awesome. God gives us those little bits and pieces, and that's what science is all about, discovering the little bits and pieces that God has created. And you know, but the, but the deal is that science is not in conflict with God. It is not at all and never will be. And as a matter of fact, look what it says here. The only reason that we see that maybe, maybe it could be in conflict is because of sin and the willfulness of man. That's why, look at what it says here in, oh no, I'm lost. Okay, okay, so in Romans, <laughs> Romans 8, 20 through 22, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of, of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. It groans and labors, and it, it seems like it's in conflict. It seems like it's out of control. But it's all because of man and man's sinfulness. It's not because of the cars we drive, okay? <laughs> it's not because uh, global warming or the gases, those things. They may, it's because, you know what? Sin is in mankind. We are sinful, willfully sinning against. We, as Romans 1 says, we suppress the truth of God with our unrighteousness. We suppress it. We suppress it. Or you could say, with the natural. It's suppressed. The spiritual is suppressed by the natural. And therefore, there is no hope. And the, and the world struggles in that. People struggle in that. The world itself, creation is struggling within that because of the sin of mankind. So when, in reality, the amazing thing is there's nothing that is outside of God's power, but in, in some amazing way, because of God's love, really, he allowed mankind to make a decision that actually overrules his will. Because we know that he doesn't will for any man to perish, and yet he gives, he gives the choice. He gives the choice to enter into a loving relationship with the creator of the world. He doesn't force it. It would never be love. It would never be genuine. It would never be true. It would be founded not on the foundation of his greatness and his awesomeness. It would be founded on fear. It would be founded on something that God doesn't want. He wants love and he wants relationship. He wants us to come to him freely giving ourselves to him because we understand this foundation that he is the creator. You know what? I love this. I love this idea. He commanded and it stood fast. <laughs> That's amazing. He commanded and it stood fast. I think that we can take that as a promise you know, that, it, I mean, it's literally referring to creation. He commanded it, creation. It came into being and it stood fast. But I think that any of the promises of God, we can stand on them and they stand fast in our lives. His promise is fastness, sturdiness, solidness. Nothing can waver it. So be encouraged in the Lord. Take hope in the fact that he commands it and it stands fast. So the Lord looks down. This is the third section. The Lord looks down from heaven, and we're going to go through this rather quickly. He, he, he looks down <clears throat> from heaven. He sees the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their heart individually. He considers all of their works. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. Um, a mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. On those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. So this section is just looking at, you know, man and our relationship to him. You know, the nations of the world, we can sing it. Uh, in the first service, Jesse read um, uh, Psalm 2. I don't think you did in this service. I was hoping you did. But uh, you should go home and read it, okay? Because <laughs> I was struggling whether I was going to put it on here and read it because Psalm 2 really, it, it like expounds this whole di idea of the nations making counsel. You know what? People make plans. We shouldn't be surprised by how the world is responding to the pandemic or all of the things that they're trying to do, mandate and control. You know, you, 
we shouldn't, it shouldn't be a surprise to us at all. This word tells us that the, you know, man has plans, man has counsels, man does things. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. The once born, they do that because they have no foundation in who God is. They push it away. They suppress it. So we shouldn't be surprised as people when we see that. We should remember that the plans that they make are temporary and that they have no hold upon us. And that our spiritual life, it actually brings hope when we elevate that above the natural and the mandate of man or the counsel of man. We should realize that. We should see that. It should give us hope that God is over all of that. So the counsel of the nations, he brings it to nothing. He makes the plans of people of no effect. You know, I was thinking through uh, the whole idea of war is amazing, isn't it? That things happen. And sometimes, you know, so I think I have a weird idea about war sometimes. And I think that God is not really a part of it or something. And we want to say that, you know, we want to find peace and peace. I don't know, but I was just thinking through, and this is just me talking. Okay. <laughs> this is just me talking. This is just in my thoughts. I want you to know that I was, <clears throat> because I was just struck with the whole idea is God is over all of that. Yeah. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of lives, but don't you think when lives are affected that God actually is over it and he sees it and he sees every single thing that's happening, something like the pandemic. Do you think that something could fly under God's radar? That is so huge like that. No way. There is no way. No war, no nothing can ever just fly under God's radar. And oh boy, what happened there? No, God is completely, completely in control of it. He's in it. He exists in it. It's a stumbling block. That is a complete and total stumbling block. It's a stumbling block to the world. And it can be to our hearts if we don't allow the truth of this foundation of who God is and who Jesus is to be the very center. And it can even stumble even believers into thinking, you know, it, it is a cruel world, but it's sin that causes that. It's mankind that causes that. God is over and he allows it. I mean, there the authority, he establishes authority. There is no authority that just appoints itself. None, not one, ever. In the history of mankind, ever. We need to get that into our heart and understand that. And then understand that his counsel, this is his counsel. His counsel stands. His counsel will never be moved. And this is his counsel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. All the bad stuff, all of the things that man does, it is all an opportunity for repentance. All an opportunity for repentance, and it flows into his counsel, which governs the world, which is this. And it's centered on Jesus. All of history, all the future, it all focuses in onto this counsel. This is his counsel, that he loves the world. He loves his creation. And that he gave his only begotten son to deliver his world from the, the sickness of the sin and the death of sin. See, man can do all kinds of things. Man can um, think a lot of things. We can plan all kinds of stuff. Isaiah 55 says this, <clears throat> For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Jeremiah 29, 11. I'm sure you're familiar with this. This is a beautiful promise. And I have to qualify this promise, really, because literally this promise, and I this is exciting to me when I think about it. You know, this promise is actually given to the nation of Israel. And if you read the whole passage, which you should sometime, read the whole passage, see where we pluck this promise out, okay? We pluck it out and we say, I want this in my life, but there's a whole scripture that is there based on the nation of Israel. And you need to look at that. Not just pluck this promise out, because this is awesome. Because the nation of Israel is assigned to the world. It is a sign, always. From the beginning, from its very beginning, it was created to be a sign of God to the world. His people set apart for him. They did a miserable job in a lot of ways. But, you know, that's all part of his plan. 
And it shows us his grace and his love. But in the end, all his promises, all his, the, their future, every promise that he promised the nation of Israel will literally be fulfilled. It will all be fulfilled. And that's why the millennial reign of Christ, that thousand year reign is so important because every single one of God's promises in the Old Testament will be fulfilled to his people. All of them, every single one. You know, and then you then you realize when you when you have that perspective, you realize why anti-Semitism is not just a man-made thing. Anti-Semitism is the enemy trying to destroy God's word. Because if he can take out the nation of Israel, if he can completely annihilate the Jews, he can show that God's word was not fulfilled. Let that just sink into your heart. The nation of Israel is super important to God. He's invested his promise and his word literally into a people. Literally. So we can come to this passage, which we should, and we should apply it to our lives, but we shouldn't break it away from what God intended. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's God's thoughts towards us. That's his counsel towards us. That's what he purposes in his heart, that he would give us a future and a hope. I mean, that should, and it does. This verse is precious. We should hang on to it in the, in the difficult times, in the good times, all times. We should hang on to that. That is God's heart. Luke 12, 6 through 7 says, Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? They're worthless, basically. They're, they're, they're sold for less than a penny. They're not of value to men at all. And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. See, God is saying that the sparrows, they're, they're worthless, and yet God knows every single one of them. I mean, you, you've gone into the Walmart parking lot, right? And you see this whole cloud come down on the French fries. Mm, you know, and they just devastate it, you know, and you're going, wow. No, God provided that for them. We could think that that, that that French fry was given to those sparrows so that they would be able to live another day. I mean, if you think about a hummingbird, wow, they have to have food every, I don't know how many hours, I can't remember. I studied that a long time ago. They have to have a lot of food all the time. Uh, their little hearts beat, 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 their little wing. You know what? They, they, they go, it's amazing. It's amazing. They are a marvel and a miracle. God provides them with a flower here and there, okay? <laughs> so they can stick their face in it and eat. I mean, that's awesome. That's what he's saying here. God provides for even the things that we think are worthless. He provides for them. So much does he provide for you? Think about it. How much more do you think he cares about you that he sent his only begotten son into the world that he would die for you and give you hope, give you a relationship with him? It's amazing. So don't fear the world. Don't fear the natural. Don't fear what people are saying. Remember, God loves you. He sees you. He looks down upon you. He knows you. He has a plan and a purpose for your life, regardless of your health issues, regardless of all of those things that, you know, weigh us down. He knows, he sees, and he loves you just the same. And I hope that you see that. I hope that you will be encouraged by that. I hope that hope will spring alive in your heart because of the foundation of who God is. The last part of this, um, well, let me, let me read this really quick because this is a precious verse that we need to remember. <clears throat> but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. <sighs> who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. I mean, that... We have, we have received something that we don't deserve. There's nothing in us. Like Jesse was saying before, we, there's no way that we could ever deserve anything. We can't work it up. We can't make it happen. We can't build it. We can't, <laughs> there, there's no way. 
It's only by through, through our trust and our belief, our laying down our life in a repentant and submitted heart to the Lord, that we can experience this, being a royal priesthood, being a holy nation, being his own special people. It's a beautiful thing, and he loves, he loves us. And um, our response should be this. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. I mean, that's our response, that we would wait upon him. In all the circumstances, the situations of our life, we can't control things. We don't know what's going to happen. We just wait upon him. We let him have his way. We hope in him. Our heart should rejoice in the very basic truths that we see here in this scripture. That he, that the word of God created all things and the word of God is working in our lives and working for our lives. And that in him, we will have a future and a hope. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. And that's my prayer this morning as we, that we would not trust in the things that are natural, that we would let go of those and we'd realize, and I think that we know that, I, you know, if you've lived for any amount of time, you realize that once you go down that natural road and you just think that nature is going <laughs> to save you, it's just not. You know, or that you can in the own strength and power of your own life, that you can make a difference. You just can't, it's when you turn and when you spiritually look to the Lord and you let the spiritual rule, that's when hope arises. That's when joy arises. Even in a crummy situation, joy and hope just arise. They spring out of the heart. It resounds through the power of the spirit into us as his creation. We feel the living nature and power of God in our lives. And that's what we need to walk in. That's what the world is going to see that makes us different. You know, it's that hope that we have that springs out of the foundation of God being over and in all things and consisting in him. So my encouragement is that you allow that spiritual nature of your life, that spiritual man, that spiritual woman that you are to rule over the natural things. Lord, we thank you for your gift to us. Lord, we thank you for the love that you have for us. Lord, we thank you that you see us. You see every little thing about our lives. You see every situation. You see all of the hurt. You see all of the joy. You see all of the the time that we spend. You, you, you know it all. The thoughts that we think, and sometimes that's kind of scary to think about because I know the thoughts of my heart. They're not always that great. But Lord, you see it all and you love us just the same. And you know exactly who we are. There's not a surprise. And there's not a surprise to you in this room at all. It's all there for you to see. And Lord, we just really thank you that you love us in the midst of all of that. Lord, that you care for us and that you move within the messes of our life. And Lord, we want to open our hearts and our lives to receive the hope that you have, the goodness and the mercy, Lord, that we can extend the grace that you have given to us in a free way to the people around us. And so, Lord, I just thank you for everyone that's here today. Thank you for your word. I thank you for how it is so foundational to us. Help us to see it and remember it. And we just pray that you would have your way in our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.